Hey City Church family, welcome back to day 11 of the Genesis Video Bible Study series. Uh, today we're going to do again what we did a couple days ago, uh, where we combine certain passages uh, to tell the story in a more sort of linear way. Uh, this will help us from having to keep us from having to circle back and talk about different parts of the story, the same people. It's also going to help us as we go through the book, um, not talk about the same themes over and over again. I to try to pull them together, compile them in certain places. So this is another one of those weeks. Uh, so you'll see in the screen all these passages, but we're going to look at some sections from Genesis chapter 16, chapter 21, and chapter 25. The verses will be listed on the screen. And this is all the story basically of Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael. So take a moment, read through those passages, and come right back. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully you had a chance to look at those passages. This is interesting because as we saw uh, with Abra Abraham and Isaac, uh, there's a lot of times where the patriarchs and their families uh, mess up a lot. They disobey the Lord. They struggle uh, with, with faith. Um, and, and we saw the deception of Abraham and Isaac in a, in a previous lesson. This is another one of those studies where we see it's a time of stumbling really for every human involved. Uh, people on both sides of an issue are, are disobeying God, acting in selfish ways. Uh, in this case, Abraham and Sarah, are, I think, are doing more of that. But there are two sides of this story. Uh, but despite all of this, God sees all the human parties involved. He pays attention to what's going on in their situation, and he rescues them. Uh, God works to protect his people and to preserve the plan of redemption that he's been talking about since the fall happened. Uh, and this is the family that he's chosen to send the Redeemer through. And even though they, they just screw it up, they mess it up over and over again, God works to, to care for them. That doesn't mean there's no consequences for their actions, but he works to care for them and, and to preserve his plan of redemption for you and me. Uh, we're, we should be thankful for his grace in that. And again, in this passage, you will see uh, his heart for those beyond the nation of Israel. Uh, so what you see in uh, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 16 uh, is S Sar Sarai, she's still named this, she's named Sarah later, uh, but she's still struggling because she still hasn't had that baby that God's been promising. It says, Abram's wife Sarai had not borne any children for him, but she owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. They had a lot of servants and slaves. Um, this one particular lady, her name is Hagar. She's from Egypt. Sarai said to Abram, since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave. Perhaps through her, I can build a family. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. Uh, this is a very strange custom, uh, at least from our perspective. In their, in their day, it happens actually more than once uh, in the book of Genesis. Jacob will end up doing the same thing with he already has two wives, but each of his wives uh, send him in uh, to one of their own servants. Uh, and so under their cultural understanding, uh, this child born to the servant of Sarai would be considered Sarai's child. I mean, there's all kinds of problems with that. Um, and and he, even the fact that she's, I don't know how much choice Hagar had in this. Uh, the, the, the root problem of it all is a lack of faith. Sarai did this because she doesn't trust God. She's frustrated uh, with the delay with her infertility. And she sends Abram in. Essentially, uh, I would call it, you could call it adultery from one perspective. Uh, you could call it polygamy, certainly from another perspective, because she's being treated as a concubine. Um, scripture does not endorse any of those things. And I know that Scripture doesn't stop here and say, and Abraham sinned against the Lord when he did this. But I will just point out to you that any time in Scripture you see a major figure like Abraham, David, Jacob, uh, Solomon, and major figures practice polygamy, it goes really poorly. Uh, and especially, it makes sense when we see in Genesis uh, chapter 2, God said that, he will, he, that the man will join uh, his wife and they will become one flesh. It's not man and wives. Uh, scripture clearly calls us only to marry one man, one woman, uh, for until death do us part. Uh, and so Abram is sinning against the Lord here in multiple ways, uh, and Sarai is sinning in her lack of faith. And this decision will have massive repercussions, both for their immediate family, for, for their group, but also for the world, as I'll talk about at the end. Uh, so look what happens here in verse 4. 
Uh, he slept with Hagar and she became pregnant. When she saw that she was pregnant, this is where Hag Hagar sins, her mistress became contemptible to her. Uh, some translations say uh, she looked on her mistress with contempt or she treated her mistress with contempt. So it, speak, it says basically, you know, Sarah's waited all, or Sarai's waited all this time to become pregnant. Years and years and years, she's, she's very old. She isn't becoming pregnant. Hagar looks like it happens pretty quick and she gets haughty about it. She gets prideful and even contempt toward her, towards uh, Sarai. Uh, and and I, I just have to stop here because um, infertility is a growing issue. Uh, I think as a pastor, I see it increasing with uh, couples that I, that I counsel with. Um, and our own personal testimony, me and my wife, uh, we, got, we, we started trying to get pregnant um, about five years after getting married. We got pregnant almost immediately and then had a miscarriage almost immediately after that. And then we went through two plus years of infertility. And so, and, and God, God has chosen to, to bless us and give us uh, one adopted child and, and four biological children after that. Uh, and so I'm thankful that we're not still experiencing that and I'm compassionate to folks who are. Uh, I remember what that felt like. And I just wanna share something with you because some of the most hurtful things were said to us by church people, people that we loved, that loved us, that did not think, that were insensitive, um, and, and people would say things like, well, you just need to relax. You just need to go away and relax and not think about it and you'll get pregnant. I, we've heard that many times. Uh, uh, things like, uh, it'll happen, it'll happen. Just don't worry about it, it'll happen. When you say that to someone, you don't know. You, you probably don't know if they, they could have had a hysterectomy. Uh, they have, may have had a diagnosis from a doctor that it is medically impossible that they will ever conceive. Please, Please, couples in your church who don't have children yet, please do not pressure them. Please do not ask them, when, when are you going to have kids? When are you going to do this? You don't know all of their story. They may not be able to have children. And every time you do that, it hurts their hearts. And I'll say one more thing. Please do not treat adoption as a second class child. I literally had one lady that, that was in a church that I pastored, not saying which church, it is, it, was not my, it is not my current church, a church that I pastored, she came up and, and she was telling a story about someone she knew who had lost, who had biological children and had a, an adopted child. And she, I think the adopted child had died. And she said to my wife, who, we had an adopted child at the time. She said, this is a lady in church. Can you imagine how much more grief she would have experienced if, if it had been her own child that had died? That is, it could not be a more unbiblical statement. Um, every adopted child, when you adopt them, they are your own child as much as any biological child. And if you're a Christian, you've been adopted into God's family. You don't want God to treat you like a second class member of the family, and he doesn't. Uh, and so please, I beg you, church, please be sensitive to people who don't have children. You don't know why they don't. Uh, and, and don't pressure them. Uh, speak the truth in love. Uh, love on them, uh, no matter what's going on in their lives. I gotta move on here. Uh, sorry for the mini sermon. <laughs> Verse five. Uh, then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for my suffering. So Sarai's experienced this contempt from her servant. She turns to Abram and blames him. Infertility is really painful. It's not. She's the one who had the idea but it doesn't matter. She lashes out to Abram because she's just hurting here. Or, uh, I put my slave in your arms, and when she saw that she was pregnant, I became contemptible to her. May the Lord judge between me and you. He said, may God judge you for your actions in this. Uh, verse 6, Abram replied to Sarai, Here, your slave is in your hands. She, she's yours. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarai mistreated her so much that she ran away from her. So Abram and Sarai are sinning here again. They're mistreating Hagar. Uh, she shouldn't have treated Sarai that way, but they should not have treated her so poorly that she literally ran. I mean, they're in the wilderness. They're in the desert. And she runs away. In verses 7 through 10, just to summarize, uh, Hagar's out there in the, in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness uh, by a spring. And God does not abandon Hagar. Uh, he sends an angel to her with the message in verse 10, which really echoes promises to Abram. Listen to this. He says, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your offspring and they will be too many to count. 
That sounds just like what God has said to Abram about the, his offspring being like the sand of the sea and the stars in the sky. Now, Ishmael is Abram's son, so this makes sense. That's that uh, the effects of these promises will be passed on in some way. He's not the son to whom all the covenant promises will come. That will be Isaac. The Lord's made that clear. Uh, but you can see the, the sort of the... Uh, passing on of the effects of God's promises to Abram here. Uh, verse 13, listen to Hagar's words. So she named the Lord. That's a powerful thing. She comes up with a new name for God based on how kind he's been to her. She named the Lord who spoke to her. You are El Roy, which means God sees me. A powerful statement. A powerful statement of faith, of worship, really. God sees me. I will call you El Roy, the God who sees. Um, for she said, in this place, have I actually seen the one who sees me? And of course, it is. it says the angel of the Lord is speaking to her. And in some cases, the, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, many think it could be an Old Testament appearance of Christ. I'm open to that in this passage, although I don't think we know for sure. Uh, at the end of the chapter, she does have a son born to her. Uh, she survives the wilderness experience while pregnant. The Lord sustains her. And she has this son, Ishmael. It says Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael is born. She goes back at that time, uh, before the birth, uh, to, to Abram and Sarai. So Sarai's lack of faith, and Abram's not only lack of faith, but poor leadership of his home, lead to this difficult situation. Now watch this develop after Isaac is born. And I'll, we'll cover that story in a different passage, the birth of Isaac. Uh, but look at chapter 21. Uh, in verse 9, what's going on here is a feast basically to celebrate Isaac's weaning. He's no longer nursing. It's a, it was a common thing in those days to do a, a feast at that time. It's a, it's a rite of passage in a sense. He's growing up a little bit. Uh, verse 9, but Sarah saw the son, that's Ishmael, mocking the one Hig, Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham. Uh, you should know not to make fun of, uh, of a young baby boy, especially when the party that day is all about him. And But Ishmael was making fun of him. We don't know exactly what was going on. Um, but Sarah, uh, by this time her name is Sarah, uh, and she's had enough and she tells she kicks out Hagar and Ishmael. Tells Abraham to kick him out. This is, this is distressing to Abraham. Uh, he loves Ishmael. He's his son. He should love him. God tells him, though, that he will take care of Hagar and Ishmael. He says, Isaac is your promised son, but Ishmael will become a nation as well. Again, there's echoes of Genesis 12. You will become a great nation. It happened in multiple ways. The Israelites, the Ishmaelites, Midianites, and others. Uh, so notice here God's mercy throughout these chapters, really for both sides of this dispute. Uh, for Abraham and Sarah and Isaac on one side, and then Hagar and Ishmael on the other. God is merciful and patient uh, with both of them. And what happens next is sort of a repeat of what we saw in chapter 16, where Hagar goes out into the wilderness. But this is an even more gripping scene. It seems more dire here. Look at uh, verse 14 of chapter 21. Early in the morning, Abraham got up, took bread and a water skin, put them on Hagar's shoulders, and sent her and the boy away. This, this, I'm sure this was extremely hard, uh, a very tough uh, departure. She left and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. That's the second time she's been in the wilderness now. When the water in the skin was gone, she left the boy under one of the bushes and went and sat at a distance about a bow shot away. For she said, I can't bear to watch the boy die. While she sat at a distance, she wept loudly. It's a gripping scene. God heard the boy crying. Listen, God sees. He sees. We saw that in chapter 16. He hears. Chapter 21, God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's wrong, Hagar? Don't be afraid, for God has heard the boy crying from the place where he is. It reminds me of other places in Scripture where, where God hears the cries of his people. He hears in Exodus the cries of Israel when they're in slavery. Get up, he says, help the boy up and grasp his hand, for I will make him a great nation. Repetition of that promise about Ishmael. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well. I don't know if it was already there and she missed it. And God opened her eyes uh, to it, to, to seeing it for the first time. Or if he created it in that moment and opened her eyes to it. Uh, but either way, he can do both. He's sovereign and he provided miraculously. So she went and filled the water skin and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew. He settled in the wilderness and became an archer. He settled in the wilderness of Paran and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt, the land of her own, uh, her own origin. So uh, 
what, ha what we see here, again, is God's care and provision for Hagar and Ishmael and renewal of the promise to him. And what happens in chapter 25, verses 12 through 18, shows the fulfillment of those promises. This is right after this section in chapter 25 that shows Abram's death. Now, the, the Ishmael's death didn't take place right after that. It was almost 50 years later. But the, this is how the, uh, Moses, when he was writing Genesis, kind of orders um, the events here. I think just as he's kind of tying up, sort of tying, like tying up loose ends, finishing up the story of Ishmael's life. Um, so what happens here is uh, chapter 25, verse 13. Notice this. These are the names of Ishmael's sons. Their names, according to the family records, are Nebaioth, Ishmael's firstborn, then Kedar, Abdeel, and he goes on. Uh, there's quite a few sons, uh, 12 sons, and they all become leaders of their clans. Interesting parallel uh, to Jacob having 12 sons as well. God, um, God blessing both of these uh, families and making nations out of them. What's interesting is that the first two sons' names, Nebaioth and Kedar, they became the names of two major ancient Arabic tribes. Many Muslim Arabs traced their lineage back to Ishmael. So this became true. Ishmael, Ishmael became the father of a nation. Uh, many, many, you, you could, I'm not sure that there's a more clear ancestor to Arabs in general than Ishmael. I don't know that he's the ancestor of all of them, but these two major tribes come from names of his uh, sons. So three things to think about here. Number one, see God's mercy and patience with all parties involved. Uh, he, he is He's kind to them. He takes care of them. He provides for them, even rescuing uh, their lives in a couple of instances. Number two, see the potential long-lasting effects of your actions. You do not know how your actions can impact someone else in, in your time or way down the road. Uh, and I think we can all make sense of this right now when we're, while we're enduring coronavirus. Somebody in China uh, first, they said it was from this web market. Now there's apparently a lot of evidence that it originated from a lab in China. I don't know the real story there, but this that's where the virus started. Uh, and those actions, whatever they were, they've affected all of us on an absolutely global scale in terms of deaths and financial ruin for many. Uh, you're, you don't know how your actions will impact somebody else. And for uh, Sarah and Abraham, their actions, their disobedience, their lack of faith in this moment led to these two sons. One became the father of Israelites. One became the father of Arabs and many Muslims. I know that's religious and ethnic. That's different. But they all, they tra many of them trace their lineage back to Ishmael. And those two groups have had intense conflict for centuries. And it started here. There's conflict in this family. Uh, and and what a massive result thousands and thousands of years later. Uh, so, so you don't know how your actions are going to impact someone else. Walk in faith. Walk in obedience to God. And, and third, kind of re related to that, instead of acting in faithlessness and disobedience, because that was what this was for Abraham and Sarah, lack of faith, disobedience. Instead of doing that, trust God's plan and timing, even when it's hard. And this was hard. I, I, I don't want to sit in judgment of them at all, personally, because they've been waiting for decades. Uh, but, but God was still faithful. Uh, sometimes it's really hard, but God has never failed yet. And he will use the weight to make you more like Jesus. And I think Hebrews 11, when we look at Abram's life, it confirms that. That God completed the work that he was doing in Abram and in Sarah uh, through this weight. They had moments of stumbling, but God was merciful and patient. And he used it to grow them in faith. And they're held up to us as models of faith. God will grow you more like Jesus through the weight, through the pain. And he will show others the power of the gospel at work in you as you trust and obey him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Abraham and Sarah, Hagar and Ishmael, this amazing true story. I thank you for your mercy and patience all in the midst of it. I thank you that though many times in this story they were faithless and disobedient, you showed yourself faithful and kind and gracious. God, thank you that you preserved this family through whom you sent the Savior for us. Lord, I, I ask uh, that you would bring many amongst uh, the Jews to Jesus, many amongst Arabs and Muslims to Jesus, uh, and many all across the world, Lord, send laborers into your harvest so they are, all, of, all men can follow Abraham in faith, can be sons of Abraham through following you and trusting you. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's free resource is just kind of a general thing that I'm throwing out there. As a pastor, uh, for a long time, um, I had uh, many 
several nice concordances. I spent a decent amount of money on concordances. If you don't know what a concordance is, it's basically a, usually a book that's about this thick, and it has it doesn't have every instance of the word the usually, uh, but it'll have every instance of pretty much every word in the Bible, and you can look up by word, and then it'll have a list under it of um, of how many times or where that appears in Scripture. It's a useful resource in a lot of ways. Um, in most cases, I'm not using a, a concordance uh, to look up numbers of words. In some cases, word studies and things like that for sermons, I understand what a word means. It still has a use in that, although I can often use um, like a website I've already showed you, esv.org. You can search on that site. Uh, CSB and other versions have similar things. You can even use Bible Gateway to search like that and see instances of a word. Um, but I, what here's what I do most of the time. If I'm trying, if I'm thinking of a verse, I'm like, I cannot remember that reference. I can just say, I, I know where this one is, but let's just say, I'm um, like, where is that verse that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your understanding. I just pull up Google on my phone or my computer. I just type in, trust in the Lord with all your heart and Google it. And usually like the top reference gives me that, or the top answer that Google comes up with is the reference for that verse. Somebody's written an article on it, or it comes up on the Bible Gateway page or whatever. So I don't even usually pull my concordances off the shelf anymore. Uh, and that's good, especially in a time like now where I'm working from home, writing messages right here. Uh, Cause a lot of my resources aren't here at the house. Uh, so anyway, I encourage you just, it's, it's a powerful tool beyond just looking up websites. You can look up Bible references with it. So that's something I've started to use. Hope that helps you. Maybe the next time that you can't remember where a verse is in the Bible or you can only remember the first half of it and want to see what the rest of it says. God bless you. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.